The largest machine ever built is the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. Its primary goal was the discovery of the Higgs boson, the fundamental particle which gives all objects mass. The LHC team actually achieved this audacious goal in 2012, winning them the Nobel Prize in physics in the process. Today on Talk Python to Me, Kyle Cranmer is here to share how Python was at the core of this amazing achievement. This is episode number 29, recorded Thursday, September 24th, 2015. I'm a developer in many senses of the word Cause I make these applications But I also use these verbs to make this music I construct it line by line Just like when I'm coding another software design In both cases, it's about design patterns Anyone can get the job done It's the execution that matters I have many interests Sometimes I conflict My creativity can usually... Welcome to Talk Python to Me A weekly podcast on... Python, the language, the libraries, the ecosystem, and the personalities. This is your host, Michael Kennedy. Follow me on Twitter where I'm at mkennedy. Keep up with the show and listen to past episodes at talkpython.fm and follow the show on Twitter via at talkpython. This episode is brought to you by Hired and Codeship. Thank them for supporting the show on Twitter via at hired underscore hq and at codeship. I don't have much news to share this week, but I am both honored and thrilled to bring you this episode, and I can't wait for you to listen to it. So let's get right to the interview. Let me introduce Kyle. Kyle Cranmer is an American physicist and professor at New York University at the Center for Cosmology and Particle Physicist and affiliated faculty member at NYU's Center for Data Science. He is an experimental particle physicist working primarily on the Large Hadron Collider based in Geneva, Switzerland. Cranmer popularized a collaborative statistical modeling approach and developed statistical modeling, which was used extensively for the discovery of the Higgs boson at the LHC in July 2012. Kyle, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, we have some amazing science and programming to talk about today, so I'm really excited to dig into all these topics with you. Yeah, no, I'm uh, excited to see where it goes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. So let's... You know, we're going to talk about the Large Hadron Collider, about using Python for scientific research and all those sorts of things, as well as some other cool projects that you got going on. But uh, people like to know how uh, folks like you and your, your position kind of got started, and they like to hear the background. So maybe we could start with, you know, what got you interested in physics and what got you interested in programming, and how do you get to where you are? I've been interested in, you know, in physics, uh, you know, since I was a kid, not really knowing that that's what it was called, but... Uh, Later on, you know, I think, uh, I guess it was in high school is when I really realized that it was physics that I wanted to do. Um, I grew up in Arkansas, and, you know, Arkansas is not exactly known for, like, leading the tide of physicists and computer <laughs> scientists in the world. Uh, but they had started a special math and science high school that, uh, it was public school, but you actually lived there. And when I was there, I was just surrounded by all sorts of people, kind of the, the nerds and geeks of, uh, of Arkansas, and it was really a special time. So... During the, that time, I you know got even more into physics, but it's also that's when I was first exposed to serious programming. Um, so actually, even Python, like in in ninety five, uh, well actually ninety four, I guess I, I had a friend that was into early web things, and he was playing with Zope and the Zope you know object data <laughs> wow. database, and uh, so I started working with him and did some early web projects, and that was kind of my first exposure to Python. So that was a long time ago, uh, but. Uh, um, and then that's, it's funny how much those experiences kind of keep re being revisited today. Yeah, I'm sure you keep coming back to that. You know, basically programming these days uh, seems like a required skill to be a physicist. Yeah, no, it, it, well, it depends on what you do, but definitely for, for what we do, um, programming is, is a required skill. And uh, unfortunately, it can, you know, for people that don't have those strengths, it really takes away from their ability to try to do the physics that they want to do. Um, so, um, you know, so for incoming graduate students, you usually see a pretty big divide between people that are, have some programming skills and don't. And, uh, usually the people that don't will catch up a little bit later, but, uh, you know, you lose time and that's unfortunate. Right. I'm sure it's a, like a huge scramble, like, oh my gosh, I got to learn all this programming stuff too, because, you know, we have right. projects or whatever, right? Right, right. It also colors a lot of the flavor about how we approach computing because somehow, uh, you, you have this enormous computing problem that you need to deal with uh, and you would like to do it as nicely as possible, but it also can't be too fancy or the bulk of the 
of the physicists might not be able to understand what's going on. You have older physicists from the Fortran days, and you have younger physicists that maybe never took any, you know, programming courses, like any serious programming courses. Um, so things have to be somehow kept simple, uh, but still work for the difficult problems. And so it's a difficult balance to strike. Yeah, I'm sure. So let's talk a little bit about what you guys are doing at the Large Hadron Collider. And first of all, you know, congratulations on the Higgs boson discovery. That's amazing. Oh, thank you. No, it was, uh, it was, uh, yeah, many, many years of work. And, uh, when it finally came, it was, uh, it was a huge treat. I don't know. It's funny to have such a, a big thing like that happen fairly early in your career. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. It's like now what? <laughs> yeah. So, um, but yeah, so at the LHC, you know, we have this huge collider that's in Switzerland. Um, it's about 17 miles around and underground. There are all these super connecting magnets that help protons go you know, bend them in a circle at essentially the speed of light. And they're colliding together uh, all the time. They smack into each other and they make a, a you know, a, a lot of new particles that come flying out and, uh, and they hit our detector. And our detector, you can think of sort of like a digital camera. You know, it's like basically a bunch of pixels um, and the, the particles smack into it and you, you get an image. But it's a 3D image. So it's a 3D detector and the detector is like the size of a 12 story building. So, uh, yeah, I think that, you know, when, when you just hear about particle colliders and especially LHC, you, you have a, maybe a, this idea of like a tube where things are shooting around and you know, how big does the tube have to be? Not that big, but the, the actual experiments, the collectors, I was blown away when I learned about how big they are. Like you said, 12 stories, these things are huge. Yeah, no, they are, and uh, the, the range of scales is pretty crazy because of the we have to be able to track where these particles go very precisely. So, like close to where they interact, you know, we're measuring things at the like micron level, and then uh, and then um, and then they fly out over like the size of a building, and we're still measuring where they're going at this very precise level. Um, but you know, it's, a, it's just this gargantuan thing. So you have to align it properly and all sorts of challenges there. But, um, and there are about a hundred million, you know, well, a few hundred million electronic readouts coming out of this beast. Um, so, you know, it's like a hundred megapixel camera or something like that. Uh, and we're taking 40 million photos every second. That's a stunning amount of data. <laughs> that is a stunning amount of data. And so if you, you know, we have to slap special electronics like straight onto the detector to be able to start pre-processing it and compressing it and, and sort of, you know, <laughs> coming up with some way to deal with the data volume because, it, you know, it's something, it's, you know, there are just totally staggering numbers about the, the data flow that's coming out of, straight out of the detector. So and, how, do you, how do you capture and store that? Do you store that, like, on hardware right on like Atlas in the, in the machines or do you like get that into a, uh, like a cluster of servers or like what happens? Right. Right. So, um, so the, we have a kind of a hierarchical, uh, online real time system for tossing away, uh, you know, the majority of the data. So we have to actually, we write algorithms that have to look at the data and, and real time decide, does this look interesting or not? And, uh, and so we go from the sort of 40 million a second, through this like three levels of filtering down uh, and then we get to the point that we save something like a few hundred of these collisions every second um, and that's and that turns into you know several petabytes a year uh, of data that we actually analyze later that's amazing it's got to be a little stressful to work on that initial filtering algorithm because what if you threw away the Higgs boson before you discovered it right <laughs> That's right. Yeah, no, people, we always worry that we're, you know, kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Um, and uh, sorry about the uh, living in New York here. Um, <laughs> yeah, no worries. <laughs> um, so the, uh, yeah, we call that thing the trigger. And, uh, you know, that's some, something that I worked on a bit. It, it's, it's true that, like, if we don't find anything else in this next run of the LHC, you know, a lot of people will think exactly that, that maybe you know, the way the trigger was configured, we were throwing away the thing, the interesting stuff. Um, but luckily we're not stuck to that. You know, we can go and we can change it and things like that. But it's, uh, but that is the worry. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you still have the, the time spent and the energy and, and all that, right? Yeah. Yeah, sure. sure. <laughs> yeah, you, you can rerun it, of course, but you know, you gotta, got it. I suspect, um, time is a valuable thing on that machine. 
Uh, yeah, no, for sure. It's expensive to run. So, uh, um, ab- absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I have a lot of listeners who are scientists and physicists and, and data science and so on, but, uh, a lot of them who are, are probably not. And so I wanted to make a movie recommendation and a book recommendation just for people to, you know, if, if they want to kind of set the stage and learn the background of, you know, as, as part of this whole thing we're talking about, I wanted to recommend the particle fever documentary. Have you seen this? Yeah. Yeah. I actually have a, a credit in that movie. Uh, I, I, uh, I was, uh, worked with them quite a bit. Uh, and at one point there was a scene that was shot in my office, but, uh, ended up having to cut it cause it didn't really fit well with the, you know, this, it was a good choice, but it was, uh, it was painful, but, I. But they were nice. I worked with them uh, a fair fair amount and uh, uh, got to go to the like you know the opening uh, uh, in uh, in Sheffield at the Documentary Film Festival and hang out with the uh, producers and the whole the whole crew. But uh, um, it's a gr- it's a gr- it's a great film. Um, I think it re- definitely it's it's good for non physics audience. Also, it's not a technical film. It, it just basically captures what it's like to be inside one of these experiments and and the sort of stress and the you know, the drama associated to it. It's, I think it's a really one of the best science documentaries ever. I absolutely agree with you. I think it really captures the, the excitement, the imagination, the drama in, in a way that, you know, anybody could appreciate. And so I definitely recommend people watch that. It's uh, available for streaming on Netflix and iTunes and other places. And then the other thing is the book called Present at the Creation, Discovering the Higgs Boson by uh, Amir Azkel, uh, Axel, I messed up his name. But that's also really good. So people who are out there, they want to learn more about what we're talking about, I think I recommend those. Okay, great. Yeah, I actually haven't read that second book. but uh... Yeah, I, I, really, I really enjoyed that book as well. I, it predates the Higgs boson, so it, it's like a lot of anticipation. So that's cool. Oh, I see. Okay, great. Maybe we could talk a little bit about like the really big picture of software at the LHC, because there's not just one team and there's not just one experiment. There's how many collectors? Are there seven collectors? Um, right. So, the, well, there are two really big kind of multi-purpose particle detectors, Atlas and CMS, and I, I'm on Atlas. Um, and those two experiments have, you know, in the, uh, in the neighborhood, a little bit more than 3,000 physicists working on them. Um, so, you know, so it's a, there are big groups of people and, uh, and, uh, then there are two other experiments that are, you know, slightly smaller in scale, but they do, you know, and slightly more specialized in terms of the physics that they do. And then, then there are several other smaller dedicated experiments that are quite a bit smaller. Um, and so I don't, you know, the, it, it depends on how you count a little bit, but the, usually, you know, there's sort of the, the two big multipurpose detectors and, and uh, two other more specialized ones uh, that are the dominant like LHC experiments. Okay, cool. And so maybe from like the the higher level or larger scale, like the thing that actually runs the machine down into the experiments, down into more de- like the data processing details. Could you give us a picture of like what the software looks like there, what you guys are doing? Sure. Yeah. So I mean, the it's mainly, you know, we have a whole bunch of collisions and each collision, you know, if you think of with this metaphor of it being like an image, you know, it's a it's like a pipeline for doing a bunch of image processing, you know, and you're and you're looking for uh you're trying to find the collisions that, uh, that, you know, m- maybe have evidence of some new particle. So you have lots of teams of people that are looking for different things, and each of those teams will develop a little pipeline to process the data to try to, you know, to search for, for what they want. Um, also, to put it into perspective a little bit, we had a quadrillion, a, a, you know, a couple quadrillion collisions total uh, at the LHC, and when we discovered the Higgs, it was, you know, of the order of a hundred or a thousand uh, of those collisions that that were the interesting ones. So, uh, so it's a huge needle in a haystack problem. Um, but it's also not really like a data mining kind of just generally looking for something weird in the data. You, we have theories that tell us, you know, what to look for, and and uh, which is good because they're such small, <laughs> small little deviations in the data that it would be basically impossible to find if you didn't have a good guide. And then the, this processing chain, because there's so much data and performance is such an issue, most of it, well, several years ago, the, the decision was to, to write most of the software in C++. You know, C++ has also evolved a ton during the time. So, are, you uh, using like, are, are people using like C++ at 11 and, and those types of things? Right, so the different, different experiments kind of uh, 
you know, move to these new, you know, new standards and, and new computing technologies kind of at different paces. There's a lot of worry, you know, it's generally a pretty conservative uh, attitude, you know, but, uh, but we are making those kinds of transitions. Um, but, you know, you just, it has to go through a lot of vetting before we make a big jump like that. Um, they also usually have a very homogeneous computing environment in terms of like operating systems and things like that because you know we run into issues where you know you don't want to have to be worrying about like floating point arithmetic in your kernel or something you know when you because uh, it's so so you just try to yeah so it's a little bit funny you know that the CERN was responsible for sort of developing the web browser right you know and H- HTML and things like that. And so they had this huge win of, of, you know, where the web was born. And, uh, and then that was followed by this idea of like, okay, we had the web, now we're going to have grid computing. And there was a lot of money poured into it. And, uh, and the promise of the grid basically turned into what has happened with the cloud. And, uh, but in, in, you know, and then within high physics, we do have the grid, but it's kind of like a huge global, you know, batch system in some sense. So it tends to be, you know, more uniform and things like that uh, than what, you know, at first people were working really hard to be able to work over very heterogeneous computing environments. But, uh, you know, that, that all evolved over, you know, more than a decade. So, yeah, I'm sure I, I used to do a lot of work in sort of scientific computing and visualization, and it's super hard to do reproducibility and, and checking stuff, you know, right. If you've got a sufficiently complicated series of mathematical steps you can apply to something you know like if it, it's so complicated how do you know when you're right or not right you right. know how do you know when you're discovering something new versus oh it's like i expected or whatever right right well we're working a lot right now on trying to address the sort of reproducibility you know issues kind of specific and the challenges associated to our field um and there are a lot of challenges because there's so much data and the software is very complicated yeah, so the core algorithms tend to all be C++, but they're, you know, they're, they're organized into lots of, you know, lots of different tools, and, and you, know, you have a way of kind of composing this pipeline between different processing algorithms. And in the end, the configuration of that thing is such a beast that that's the first place where you see Python happening, is that we have a way of kind of you know, doing introspection on all of the tools, and then we just represent their configuration in terms of Python objects. And then there's a whole separate layer of, you know, of computing, which I mean, of programming, which is just essentially the configuration, um, and that includes both this trigger, that online system that's tossing out the data, as well as the you know the people that are analyzing the data, how they you know configure all these tools to be able to process the the kajillions of events into something that's more manageable. Now that sounds sounds really interesting. When I was doing some research, it seemed like one of the major pieces used in Atlas was this thing called Athena. Right. That's right. That's the kind of name of the C++ framework that we use uh, that also includes the way that it builds the Python bindings for configuring all the tools. And uh, yeah, so that's, yeah, I've spent uh, more, more hours than, uh, than I'd like to admit uh, doing <laughs> programming in that framework. But, um, but then what's also interesting, I think a lot of your audience will find interesting, is that once you've used that huge, heavyweight data processing pipeline, usually you get to something quite a bit smaller and that's where a lot of the more interactive and exploratory part of the data analysis happens. And, and at that stage, a lot of people, uh, well, the people stop using things like Athena for the most part. And that's where you start using, uh, see people using Python a lot more in terms of data analysis. And, uh, and so it's an interesting transition because people are always arguing about where do you make that swap, you know? And <laughs> sure. uh, yeah. I suspect you guys probably do a lot of IPython. Is that true? Well, you, you would think that more people would. Uh, the, 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 I guess part of it is that it's still, even at that stage, you still have so much data to process that the kinds of things that people end up wanting to do are, you know, well suited to having like, you know, programs that, you know, that look really like programs that run and they might be Python based, but, uh, you know, you kind of, sort of batch system-y, you run over this thing and then you get some results and look at them. There are times when you're doing something very interactive. And uh, so years ago, the, the team at CERN that makes this tool called Root, which is like kind of the dominant data analysis package in high energy physics, came up with something like an interpreter because you want to sit there and 
have this feedback loop, right? You know, like the and uh, <laughs> yeah, and where you can you know type commands, see plots, uh, and that was actually done amazingly. They wrote a C plus plus interpreter many many years ago, and uh, so you actually write these commands in C++ and then they, you know, they're, it's, they're interpreted and executed on the fly. That's actually pretty interesting by itself, isn't it? It is interesting. Um, it, of course, had all sorts of issues and C++ wasn't really meant for doing that, but it worked practically. Um, and now they've gone through and they have a much heavier duty version of, the, of this interpreter that's based on you know, clean and more modern like compiling, compiler technologies and things. But, the, uh, but Python, obviously, is the, an, another way to go with that, which is nice. This episode is brought to you by Hired. Hired is a two-sided, curated marketplace that connects the world's knowledge workers to the best opportunities. Each offer you receive has salary and equity presented right up front, and you can view the offers to accept or reject them before you even talk to the company. Typically, candidates receive five or more offers in just the first week, and there are no obligations, ever. Sounds pretty awesome, doesn't it? Well, did I mention there's a signing bonus? Everyone who accepts a job from Hired gets a $2,000 signing bonus. And as Talk Python listeners, it gets way sweeter. Use the link hired.com slash talk Python to me, and Hired will double the signing bonus to $4,000. Opportunities knocking. Visit hired.com slash talk Python to me and answer the call. So people started moving to the Python. Well, some people started moving into the Python way of doing things. I don't know what, you know, eight years ago or something like that. But it's the field is kind of split between, you know, which way. And then since then, like things like IPython and the IPython notebook have come around. I think that that's great, especially from the point of view of this of like reproducibility. So we're working now that we give tons of talks. If you go to CERN, we have this agenda system. And you can see that there are like hundreds of thousands of presentations happening within these experiments every year. That's excellent. Yeah. So one of the things, but they're always like PowerPoint or, you know, Keynote or whatever, or LaTeX based PDF presentations. And uh, you read about what someone's doing, but it's not very handy for like trying to have reproducibility or for another graduate student to pick up where someone left off. So we're, we have this effort now to try to make it so that the agenda system can you know can basically display notebooks directly, uh, so people can upload their IPython notebook directly and visualize it. And then if someone else thinks it's interesting, they can you know download it and execute it. Um, there are efforts about trying to make it so that the whole computing environment associated to that notebook can be you know packaged up so that because it, there usually, usually aren't just standalone Python IPython notebooks with the like SciPy dependency. They have a bunch of dependencies. So um, so if you can package that all up, uh, that's very handy. So there are tools like Binder now. There's a tool called Everware. Uh, and previously, there's something like SageMath, uh, which all allowed you to sort of execute a notebook, you know. But the, the, the problem was how do you get all these, you know, these software dependencies packaged up? And now that problem is starting to be solved. Right. Oh, that's, that's really excellent. Because I can imagine you guys have so much data and maybe these back-end systems you've got to reach into to actually work with the data that you're trying to, you know, do physics on. That's right. That you can't, you can't just take the, the program and hand it out, you know, like, oh, and here's our, you know, 50 gigs of data and you've got to get it this way, right? Right. And not only that, there's also things like databases that say, like, how was the detector aligned on Friday, you know, November 25th or something? You know, so it's a, um, so there are all these databases involved uh, that you have to connect to, to be, for the software to run. And that's also through tons of authentication layers. So it's a, it's a huge pain in the butt, basically. But, <laughs> uh, but people, are, people are solving it, and I think uh, that will be a huge change. Um, and the, the Project Jupiter people, you know, luckily had this great foresight to separate the notebook from the background kernel. So we're actually also writing a kernel based on this C++ interpreter of root. Uh, so it still looks like notebooks and all the display and everything is the same. But the, in the background of Python, it's the C++ interpreter, which is, you know, interesting. Yeah, I mean, that certainly opens it up to a, a much wider audience. Like you're saying, like the group that's working directly with Athena and so on, they can just, you know, 
possibly start using IPython or what do you call them? Call them Jupyter Notebooks now? I don't know. I'm not really sure what the, the naming yeah, is. The, yeah, the front end, kind of the language agnostic part is now Project Jupyter. Um, um, but it's great because we have people like Fernando Perez, who's sort of, you know, uh, leading this effort as part of this uh, advisory board for a project that we got, for, uh, a grant we got from the National Science Foundation to try to take the tools that have been developed in energy physics, which are mainly very siloed, you know, it's like we're trying to solve our problem. It's a very hard problem and we don't have a lot of extra time or money. Right. <laughs> and then, uh, but now we've done some nice things. So let's try to open that up, uh, make it more interoperable with like the scientific Python world. Um, and it's a, definitely a two way street. There are lots of other great tools out there that we don't use. So we're working on improving the interoperability of, of all of these things. Yeah. I think that's going to be good for science all over. And, the Jupiter guys just got a huge grant. I'm not sure all the folks that contributed, but it was millions, like six million or something like that. Do you remember? I don't know the number, but they they, they rightfully have been getting some support because they're doing some great things. And uh... <laughs> yeah, I'm really happy to see that. So you know, people will start being able to do C plus plus and you know, I guess Ruby and maybe imagine Fortran. I don't know. <laughs> that that yeah, probably is important somewhere in science, but <laughs> I, I try to not touch that stuff. <laughs> right. You talked about this sort of uh, uniform computing environment, and I know just where you're coming from with that, like just the whole reproducibility and setup and everything. Can you talk to, like, uh, are you using Linux? What distribution? What What do things look like there? Right. So it's definitely Linux-based. Uh, CERN has a... Um, a, a distribution called Scientific Linux um, that they maintain. I've I, I've kind of stopped following all the ins and outs of, of it, to be honest. But it, it, you know, at some point, it, it kind of was a derivative of some Red Hat type package way back in the day. But since then, it's evolved, and now I'm not I'm not even sure which distribution it's closest to. Um, but the uh, and then there's been quite a bit of emphasis and and virtualization technologies and you know open stack related things and what we're starting to see more use of now are also docker images so um so i have a student who's working on you know making you know docker images that have our very kind of specific computing environment uh, uh specifically for for the issue of reproducibility there you know where i think you also haven't really seen in high energy physics but we're starting to see now is like more and more you know, web-based tools and things like that. So you have web services. And, and we have a project going on where we're trying to make not analyses just reproducible, but reinterpretable. So, you know, you had a team of people analyzing the LHC data, and they were asking a certain question, but you can reuse that analysis pipeline to answer other questions. So we're trying to wrap up this very heavy computational, in, you know, pipeline with a very simple uh, web interface, you know, web APIs and things, so that we can, people can submit, you know, requests to the system and they'll be processed through all of this infrastructure and then you'll you know come out with a very simple answer um and uh that's really cool yeah i think it'll be great it also it addresses a lot of issues with uh, reproducibility when you have when you can't just like say you know the, the typical open open data route like here it is do it again because you know the you, <laughs> there's so many steps involved and the you know the the configuration of everything is so heavy that basically almost no one can do that. So, uh, but if the experiments host it uh, host that service, it's very valuable. So, yeah, that makes sense. I suspect if it's sufficiently complicated and has enough configuration parameters and variation, like even the original researchers couldn't reproduce it <laughs> if they didn't have the details, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I mean, without redoing the work from scratch, literally. Yeah. Right? yeah. No, exactly. I mean, the, the goal is that we should all be able to do it in practice. That's, you know, rarely, rarely checked, but, uh, but that's what we're, we're working on now is to try to make it so where we can more confidently say, yes, we can actually reproduce this stuff. That's, that's super cool. I hadn't even thought about Docker, but that makes perfect sense. I mean, I always think of Docker as, uh, here's the way I'm going to like horizontally scale my web app so I can do that easier or, or like, you know, get higher density on servers and, and web uh, data center type places, but it makes really good sense for scientific computing, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. So we have, you know, these experiments of, at this point, you know, each of the big experiments has put out, you know, several hundred papers. So you have like thousands of scientific results. And now if associated to each one of these results, you have some sort of like Docker image and the, and you can, you know, on the, on demand, spin up this service that you want to, to reproduce or reinterpret 
of what was done, then you, you end up making a very powerful high-level scientific tool. So, so it's been an idea for uh, several years, but now with you know, these tools that are around, it's really you know, possible, and, so, uh, and it's starting to, it's starting to happen. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. And are you guys th- considering or actively putting these into the official Docker repository? Um, so r- right now, that's uh, the the sort of model is that that's going to be hosted at CERN, partially because it's a lot, you know, it's a lot of uh, disk space, and we're just working closely with the CERN IT people, and there's a lot of trust between the CERN computing and IT and the experiments. So uh, so that's how that's being developed now. Um, but uh, uh, and uh, some of these things are sensitive, you know, like, uh, yeah, the, the exp- you know, these are big international collaborations and, uh, and different countries are kind of at different places in terms of their attitudes about open science and things like that. So, so some people still want to keep these things closed, uh, but, they're, but they're willing to entertain the idea of hosting the service. So, so that's a, a big political discussion. <laughs> uh, actually, the more I think about it, that uh, it starts to bring me back to when I was in grad school. Yes, I can see <laughs> that. So I suspect once a paper is published in a peer-reviewed journal and, and approved, pretty much everybody would be um, pretty happy to have their stuff public. But as you're developing that, right, before you've declared the Higgs boson to be found, for example, you wouldn't necessarily want to give all your algorithms away and let other people take a shot at it, right? You want to keep that until you're until you're ready to publish your papers and, and publicly do your results, right? Yeah, no, that, that's true. And also, uh, you know, I mean, the, the experiments also worry a lot about, uh, you know, you, you have to be kind of careful about the scientific message that's coming out of these experiments. I mean, they're very, very expensive international uh, projects and uh, you don't want people like claiming this and that and adding a lot of noise and 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 drama. So you know we work very hard to get lots and lots of internal cross checks of things and then make sure everyone's on the same page. And then we want to have kind of one unified voice from an experiment, and then we have another experiment to to check it. Um, but uh, we don't want too much noise. So so that you know that's the, a lot of the motivation for uh, for keeping these things kind of internal until they're they're ready. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it took several years for the Higgs boson analysis to finally declare, hey, we found it, right? Uh, yeah, that had a lot to do with just collecting enough data. Um, once we had enough data, uh, the, the, the process was sort of streamlined enough that it was really a matter of like a week and a half or something. It was about a week and a half that we went from <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> the last data that we had to the the talk that, you know, where the, the uh, discovery claim was made. So, but that was, in some sense, just like adding the last, last bits of data. But uh, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, very cool. So I want to ask you a few more things about uh, LHC and, and CERN and particle physics, and then we could talk about space a little bit, maybe. Oh sure, yeah. So you said one of your goals there is that you guys are trying to move towards a more sort of dedicated professional software role there at CERN. Can you talk about that a little? Oh, right. So I think, you know, the, the physicists, you know, need to write, obviously, a lot of code and be proficient to be able to do the science they want. And, and uh, but you also, there's a lot of infrastructure for the processing that's, that's needed. So, you know, typically what happened was physicists that were very strong on computing kind of specialized on that, in that, and then, and, you know, became sort of software professionals with a physics background. And, and that's, that model has worked, you know, surprisingly well. Um, there are, there are some people, you know, relatively few people that are don't really have a physics background that are really more just, uh, you know, software professionals. But uh, separately, there's been, you know, CERN has had like an IT department uh, that uh, deals with actual computing infrastructure that's going on, but has also developed several different tools that were more services. Sure, because you guys have a lot of computers, a lot of network. I, how many computers do you have there? Uh, the CERN, uh, I should know the number. Hundreds of like a hundred thousand or something, right? Like really a lot. It's a lot, yeah. I, I th- there's a there's a great YouTube video that I'll uh, that you can post the associated to it that has a wonderful overview of the whole processing. Oh yeah, that'd be awesome. And lots of little factoids uh, that's nicely produced. Um, but I, I'm not gonna say I'll, I won't say a bunch of wrong numbers. So <laughs> sure. This episode is brought to you by CodeShip. 
Codeship has launched organizations, create teams, set permissions for specific team members, and improve collaboration in your continuous delivery workflow. Maintain centralized control over your organization's projects and teams with Codeship's new organizations plan. And as TalkPython listeners, you can save 20% off any premium plan for the next three months. Just use the code TALKPYTHON, all caps, no spaces. Check them out at CodeShip.com and tell them thanks for supporting the show on Twitter where they're at CodeShip. But, the, but there were people that were working on, on that side and then also just general services for like, um, you know, like uh, the, the system we use to, to manage all the papers and the, uh, uh, and the comments to the papers and things like that and like an agenda system where people put up their talks and, you know, schedule meetings and the video services and blah, 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 blah. And, uh, and th- those, th- the people that were working on that have started branching out into the, the kinds of services they provide. So, so I guess one example that's maybe interesting is the very first website in the United States was called Spires. And, uh, it is, uh, preceded this, uh, the archive where like scientists put the versions of their papers before they're published, this preprint server. So the, the Spires was basically just a database of all of the uh, high energy physics literature, you know, like who wrote what papers and who cited whom and da 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 da. And, uh, and so it was like a, it was the first website in the United States was where physicists would go to see where, you know, where the, who's citing who and which papers are about certain topics. And that has evolved into something new called in- Inspire. And that's a, you know, an international effort. Um, but the, the software technology that it's, that's based on, which is mainly Flask based now and, you know, Pythonic uh, based things um, uh, are, has evolved into a set of different tools that are pretty nice. So one of them is a data repository where uh, this is not solving actually CERN's problem. It's like the long tail of science. All these small experiments that are out there that have some data, uh, they can put their data onto these servers and then they can refer to that data when they write their papers. So there's a service called Zenodo and Zenodo started working with GitHub and made it so that people that now, not just data that you want to point to when you're writing a paper, but the software of your paper uh, you can. There's a little webhook in, in GitHub that, whenever you make a new release, will push a copy of the of the code to the service of Zenodo, and they'll they'll the the jargon is meant a DOI, so it's a digital object identifier, which the publishing industry knows about how to use and things like that, and it points to a specific version of the of the code that was used, and you can download that version of the code. So it's sort of out of the realm of version control. It's more. It's just that. GitHub is not provided, like, people could delete their GitHub repo, but once you get a DOI, it's kind of a, a trust relationship that that code is, exactly that code is always going to be there at that link. Right, almost like escrow for your code, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's redundant in a, in a sense, but, you know, there's a link back, obviously, to the repository, so you can see how it's evolved. But uh, but this is the the, you know, the basic common denominator for all of the publishing industry and how you track citations to to different, uh, you know, research outputs, whether they be papers or data or software. So that, so that connection has been, you know, is nice. And now there are actually thousands of, uh, pieces of code that have been pushed from GitHub to Zenodo where they, and been given these DOIs and the same, that is also, you know, flask based and, uh, and they have been very nice about how they break up the project, uh, into different, you know, flask components and things like that. And now we're reusing that same kind of infrastructure, uh, to try to build these tools for doing uh, reproducibility and uh, reinterpretations and things like that, so there's a there's a new effort that's evolving that has a you know much more of a like modern you know Pythonic programming you know web services mentality, which is not necessarily coming from within the experiments, but coming from within the CERN lab, and uh, and I think it's going to change how the experiments sort of approach these problems uh, in the you know next few years. That's really cool. It seems like a huge step down the right path for reproducibility. Yeah, no, I think it's very, very important uh, for what we're doing. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. Okay, the last thing I wanted to ask you about um, was this project called Recast that you guys have going, that um, not you necessarily, but folks at CERN have an LHC have going. So Recast is the system that I was referring to that is uh, for trying to make the analyses reinterpretable. Um, and that's the one where we bring in these sort of Docker images for the for the different analysis pipelines and try to make this web service 
uh, for being able to either reproduce or reinterpret uh, one of the published LHC analyses. So that one is is definitely within CERN, but using a lot of these more modern, uh, you know, uh, web service uh, type approaches. There was another another project that maybe uh, you also wanted to talk about, which was the space one. I don't know if that's what. Yeah, absolutely. So, or I don't know if there's a we're running out of time. Yeah. No, no, that yeah, no, we definitely have time. Let's talk about that one, and that's the uh, Crayfus. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So uh, Crayfus is this project, which is we started up, which is a, a lot of fun, uh, and it's a very, very sort of small team of, of people right now. So it's it's kind of the opposite of these LHC experiments, um, and our basic idea is that. We, we want to try to detect very you know, ultra-high energy cosmic rays. So these are particles coming from outer space that have much higher energies than the LHC, and they smack the atmosphere and create a, a shower of new particles. So you get, you get tons and tons of particles hitting the ground. And the, the idea is that if you get a bunch of people running an app on their phone, uh, the camera of your phone, <laughs> the little CMOS sensor in your camera, is like a min- miniature particle detector. So... If one of these particles happens to fly through your camera, it will light your camera up. And so basically the idea is that if you get a bunch of people at night running this app, like while their phone's plugged in and they're sleeping, um, and you see a bunch of these phones light up at the same time, then that's uh, like an indication they just you just got hit by a high-energy cosmic ray. And uh, these things are very rare. So if you want to see them, like the, one of the best shots you have is to try to cover as much of the Earth uh, with a detector as you can. And, uh, and it looks like if we have, you know, in the order of a million people running this app, which is a big number, but, you know, not crazy big number, uh, that we might be able to do some, like, really cutting-edge science and, uh, um, and be able to study, like, the very highest energy particles that people have ever seen in the universe. So, so it's a really fun, you know, like citizen science project and it has a lot of data science challenges <laughs> i'm sure it does that's that's really cool so does it run on the major phone platforms iphone android things like that yeah so we have an android app and an, and an iphone app uh, that they're both kind of in beta right now um and uh and so they collect data and you know one phone can't say anything so they're uploading their data about uh, sort of when they saw flashes and uh and where they were when they saw the flashes to a you know, a, a central server, and uh, we've we've just uh, so it's been fun because we the people working on this all kind of have a LHC type of background, but we ha- now get a fresh set of choices about what we're going to use. <laughs> so the so you know we have Elasticsearch and Django and Spark and you know uh, you know just much you know more kind of modern stack of, of of tools for being able to process the data, and then we're working on trying to make it so that the final stages of the data analysis are, are more like IPython notebooks and that we have this ability to uh, not just view the notebook but to launch the notebook and recompute it. So that's using things like Sage Math or this Binder project um, and, and, uh, and Everywhere, uh, which have, you know, with Docker, all of the computing environment. And this is going to, I think, be just awesome for doing outreach because this has really grabbed the public's imagination. We got covered by NPR and Wired and some people and so the and IFL Science so we have like almost a hundred thousand people that have signed up and we're we haven't even launched <laughs> the app yet. That's really cool. So if people want to get started, how do they do it? Is that a thing they can do yet, or do we have to wait a while? Um, we're going to have to wait a little bit longer. Uh, we're we're working as as fast as we can uh, with our ragtag team, but the uh, um, but if you you can sign up for it right now if you go to the website, it's. Uh, uh, crayfish.io uh, so it's like crayfish without the h right so see yeah i'll definitely add a link c r a y f i s dot io that's right that's right fantastic so this you know reminds me a little bit of the the whole protein folding stuff that people try to do with like running it on idle computers and the study at home but but it seems even cooler because this is actually the science. That's right. Yeah, happening, not just the pro- post-analysis computational bits. That's right. Yeah, I think there's sort of three types of citizen science projects like this. There are ones like SETI at home and the protein folding, where you're basically donating compute cycles, you know, to solve a problem, but you're not really involved and in otherwise. Um, then there are projects like uh, there's a great 
a platform called the Zooniverse, which I encourage people to go check out if you like <laughs> these things. So they are the very interactive. You're like looking at pictures of galaxies and trying to uh, to classify them, or you know, like pictures of the ocean and trying to say if you see certain things in them. And it's it's a lot like Mechanical Turk. You know, you <laughs> so you you're farming out uh, this, these things that computers might not be great at. Or we don't have we're not good at writing algorithms for doing and having humans do it. Um, and this one, this project is neither of those. The citizen science is actually the instrument. I mean, you are you are doing the science, and uh, um, so that's that's uh, yeah. I think you know that makes our project really unique. Yeah, that's really awesome. So I encourage everyone out there to go sign up, participate. I'll, I'll definitely do it. This, this is exciting. Great, thank you. <laughs> yeah, and then you said this is somewhat um, done with a a grant from Amazon Web Services. That's right. Yeah. So, uh, so we talked to Amazon. They thought it was an exciting, you know, an exciting project, and so they they've been great about trying to support some, uh, in different, you know, scientific projects that that uh, need some computing uh, that you know have so, that are still in a prototyping stage, and uh, so they yeah they've given us a grant for some of the you know AWS uh, sort of budget, and and we're using that for you know collecting the data and some of our you know. Uh, you know, offline processing of the data, and and we try to make it so that there's a kind of a feedback loop, so that the you know the Django server is showing stats on what the current status of the network is, um, and uh, so it's a uh, it that's been very nice of them, and also Yandex, which is like a sort of the the Russian Google is uh, has a, a group of people that are data scientists uh, and part of a, a lab that they run that are uh, very well integrated at CERN and some of them have joined our project and they're, you know, helping us, you know, build the, uh, the, the uh, sort of offline spark based, you know, data processing system and things like that. So it's a lot of fun to have, you know, these different mix of people and a very fresh project. We move very fast. It's nice. Yeah. How exciting. I mean, I know how it is to pick up a project that's been around for 10 or 20 years it, it's kind of stale on the technology and what you can do because you don't want to break stuff, but it's nice to start over and do exciting things, right? Absolutely. Yeah. It's a breath of fresh air. <laughs> yeah, cool. So we're kind of getting short on time. Let me ask you just a few more questions before we wrap things up. What do you think the most amazing or interesting thing about the Large Hadron Collider and all the stuff you guys did there that people might not really know about? Oh, boy. Uh, part of it, I think, that's really great about the whole project is just that, you know, it, it, we have people from all around the world, right? And they're not all employed by one, <laughs> you know, one, you know, central, you know, corporation or something like that. So, uh, and we're all contributing. So I guess in that sense, it has a lot of the flavor of like a open, a successful open science, I mean, it's open software project where people are contributing from, from all around. And, uh, I think the other part is that, you know, everyone should feel proud about it because, you know, it's, you know, you, it's not a huge amount of <laughs> of your tax dollars. You know, if you look at like, I forget for every thousand dollars of taxes you pay, it's just a you know a few cents or something is going to uh, to this kind of project. But you know, everyone made this happen, and I think everyone in the world should be proud of the fact that this this happened. Uh, yeah, it's definitely a global effort, which is awesome. It is a global effort, and it's you know this is a, I mean, it's a really <laughs> big accomplishment what's happened I mean, in terms of our understanding of the universe. So. And there's obviously all of the software and computing and the technical challenges of, of pulling it off. But, uh, you know, it's a big multi-decade global thing. And, you know, I don't know, humanity should be proud of itself. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's great. How do you see Python in science sort of evolving, growing, changing, um, shrinking? I mean, right now, I think it's growing very fast. I mean, it's, you know, the whole scientific Python side of things and, you know, distributions that are working, <laughs> working better and GitHub is changing, you know, how people are doing science very, very quickly. If you look in like the, the uh, astronomy and astrophysics community, there have been, you know, some big efforts to create new analysis platforms. There's a great project called AstroPy, uh, which is a, you know, just a poster boy for, uh, you know, for different, uh, for, uh, you know, kind of open science mentality of of the community contributing to making the tools they need to do the science that they want. Um, and the that's working pretty well because you know a lot of those experiments they have a lot of new experiments coming up and they want a fresh start. 
so at the LHC, you know, we have this issue that we have a lot of legacy code and, uh, uh, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of inertia about how we've done things, but we're, we're trying to move things into a more, you know, a, a less siloed software picture that looks more like that model. And, uh, and Python is a big, I think Python is like the dominant kind of language of people that have that mentality, in, at least in, you know, particle physics and astrophysics. Yeah, that that's my feeling as well. But obviously, I do a lot less science than you do, so that's that's great to hear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the other place that you see it is just that, to the extent that data science is attached to doing sciences as opposed to like business analytics, uh, you know, you, you see just a big influx of Python and R, um, and so I think that you know there are a lot of a lot of other scientific fields that are undergoing a similar that are undergoing a similar transformation, but, uh, but maybe a little bit heavier on the R side than on the Python side. Yeah. It's definitely down to those two, I think, and modern analysis for the most part. Right. Kyle, thank you for being on the show and taking the time. I know you're super busy and this, this is really, really interesting. Thanks for sharing it with everyone. No, absolutely. Thank you for inviting me. It's great. Yeah, you bet. Take care. Bye. This has been another episode of Talk Python to Me. Today's guest was Kyle Cranmer, and this episode has been sponsored by Hired and CodeShip. Thank you guys for supporting the show. Hired wants to help you find your next big thing. Visit Hired.com slash TalkPython to me to get five or more offers with salary and equity presented right up front and a special listener signing bonus of $4,000. CodeShip wants you to always keep shipping. Check them out at CodeShip.com and thank them on Twitter via at CodeShip. Don't forget the discount code for listeners. It's easy. TalkPython, all caps, no spaces. You can find the links from today's show at talkpython.fm slash episodes slash show slash 29. Be sure to subscribe to the show. Open your favorite podcatcher and search for Python. We should be right at the top. You can also find the iTunes and direct RSS feeds in the footer of the website. Our theme music is Developers, Developers, Developers by Corey Smith, who goes by Smix. You can hear the entire song at talkpython.fm. This is your host, Michael Kennedy. Thanks for listening. Smix, take us out of here. Stating with my voice, there's no norm that I can feel within. Haven't been sleeping, I've been using lots of rest. I'll pass the mic back to who rocked it best. Developers, 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 developers.